All right, we are walking through the Old Testament. Last week, we did a little Bible drill. We got some practice in finding things in the Old Testament, which can be more complicated. We started, keep the rung of the ladder pretty low as we jump in here. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we started with Genesis, okay? So let's practice again. Let's see if you can find Genesis. Ready? Go. Awesome. You guys are really Bible scholars now. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. Now find Nahum. Uh, We'll let you warm up. Because now we're going to find another book in the Bible. And this book is Exodus. And we're going to keep the rung of the ladder pretty low again on learning. Because Exodus is the second book in your Bible. Exodus chapter 14 is where we're going to pick up the story. Story. Now, man, my voice changing is really hitting me harder than I thought it would at this stage of my life. Uh, what we're doing in the Sunday sermons, and you're, you, are, you have your books, and you're doing devotional readings uh, coming off of whatever we're talking about on Sunday, so you've spent a lot of time in Genesis in the last week. If you don't have your book yet, we still have uh, insert copies you can pick up in your classes. Those of you who signed up, go ahead and get your books. Well, they've been out here, and a lot of you have been picking, up, picking them up this morning in our walk through the Bible journey with the Old Testament. And what we're doing on Sunday mornings, we're looking at the pivot points, the times when the story shifts. So last week we looked at Abraham, and we we looked at this guy and how everything shifted when God called Abraham, a man of faith, to lead a family of faith and to grow the plan forward through them. Today, we're looking at a different pivot point. Now, I want to start out with this, and I've shared this before, uh, oh, a year or so ago, in the context of a sermon on prayer. I want to talk about it again, a little different angle, a little different information for you. And here's what I want to tell you. So we've been reaching out into our community now for, uh, we're closing in on three years, two two and a half years now, uh, going out and sharing. We're like uh, over 22,000 door knocks into the city now, uh, offering to pray and sharing the gospel in Allen, Texas, which is pretty incredible. We have two teams out this weekend who are training in other states who've been invited uh, by other churches to come and do training with them to reach their community, their friends, their neighbors with the gospel. And so this continues to be a big part of our ministry. My experience in going out and uh, done it here, done it in some of these trainings regionally where I've gone to other churches, found the same things there that I find in Allen, Texas. And that is, when we go out, we, and many of you have have this story too, we talk about it on a regular basis, we knock on a door, introduce ourselves, and say, hey, I'm I'm Chad, two people with me, we're just out caring for our neighbors this afternoon, this evening, and I wanted to see if there's anything we could do to pray for you. Do you have any prayer needs in your life? And overwhelmingly, the, the response I get most often is, no, we're, we're all good. And so, just to follow up with that, it's pretty easy to say, well, I mean, you know, just anything, family, uh, health, job stuff. And I'm amazed with that simple prompt. Then we get, oh, yeah, my mom's at stage four cancer, and I haven't had a job in six months. Oh, okay, well. That's prayer worthy. People, I think it's, people are so, prayer is so far into so many people that, that they, they need a prompt that what, what would you even pray about and how would you talk to God? And, and so this is a big part of what we do. Then we want to transition always toward the gospel. So we pray for their needs. But even, even with the prompt, a lot of times I've had people say, no, no, no prayer needs. No, none of that. Everything's good. And, uh, Sometimes that's true. Things are working out according to their plan. Everything is just as they charted it out on their dream chart of how life should be. And it's a smooth season. And and I've told people that. It's great to have a season like that when everything's just rolling. Uh, I'm always thankful for those seasons. And I'm pretty suspicious that it's not as good as they say it is at the door. But I said, could I just pray for a... For God's blessing on your home, your family, and still see if I can get to prayer, pray for them, and then, uh, and then lead them to, toward Jesus. But the temptation, temptation is everywhere in the world. And my temptation is uh, to tell them, hey, well, that's great. But you know what? 
it's going to come crashing down all around you. This is my encouraging word for you at the door today. Uh, it's about to get really bad probably in your life. And just know, I'm going to care about you beyond today. And uh, here's my phone number. Why don't you give me a call when you're desperate for God? Because the day is going to come. Last week in our walk through the Old Testament, we finished up with the last chapter of Genesis. And in that context, God's people, all of them in their social media feeds, every day they just put hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. Everything's good. Everything's up and to the right. Everything's wonderful. All is well. Uh, they were happy, living the good life. Joseph was the second most powerful guy in the world as second in command in Egypt, living the most powerful nation in the world. They had everything they, they needed, the best land in Egypt, and all was right with the world until the day it wasn't. And it came crashing down around them. The first chapter of Exodus, uh, there we get the pivot in their story. And I want to read this to you from Exodus 1. By the way, see a little Bible drill again. I told you chapter 14. Now let me make you turn to chapter 1, see if you can find it. Baby steps and learn to use your Bible. It's uh, that moment in time, you see, when the, the sweet milk of life all goes sour. How about that? Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful, increased rapidly, multiplied, became extremely numerous, so that the land was filled with them. A new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we are. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise, they'll multiply further, and when war breaks out, they'll join our enemies. Fight against us. Leave the country. So the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. We like to think that when it's all hashtag blessed, when no, I don't have any prayer needs at all. Everything is going great. We like to think, and I'm, I'm talking about me, like to think this is normal. This is how it's supposed to be. And great is how it's going to continue from this day forward. It's just always going to be wonderful just like this for the rest of time, and I need not worry about anything from this day forward. My job's always going to be secure. My family's always going to be healthy. Our relationships are always going to be happy and loving, and everything's going to be just the way we drew it up in our dream picture of life. But truth is, that's not how life works. If you've lived any length of time in this world, you know Challenges are coming. Difficulties are on the horizon. It's a broken world. It's a sinful world. Stained, poisoned by sin. The creation itself groans, awaiting deliverance, awaiting the redemption that's coming through Christ our Savior. It, and, and in a broken world, it's just, it, it's going to get worse. Sometimes we can fix it just by sheer will by our giftedness, by our good thinking. Sometimes we can buy our way out. In our country, it's a little different than Haiti and Peru where we have these two churches. Uh, well, at least we have insurance and medical care. Uh, maybe uh, uh, they don't have that kind of backup. They don't have that kind of safety net. Our relationships, uh, our relationships suddenly can shift and you're going to find things beyond your control, beyond your ability. And God actually will lead us in these journeys. He was going to lead you to a place where you can't do it yourself. Where you're just outgunned, outmanned, overwhelmed. Because when you finally get to a spot where you realize you can't save yourselves, that your only hope is a Savior, then you can meet the Savior. And everything just going to get a whole lot better. Egypt was never God's long-range plan for his people, although it became a long plan for this group of people. They, they forgot they had a covenant Abraham had made among this family, a covenant of faith and faithfulness to God. God had made this, established this relationship with this faith-filled family of people. But in Egypt, they forgot God and they forgot the covenant, and now they are slaves in a foreign land. 
And at the end of Exodus 2, this group of people who have forgotten just a whole lot they should have remembered, they finally remember. And, and they start calling out to God. God, what can you do? How can you help me? Could you deliver me? Is, could you bring us hope again? And here's what happens. The God who created the heavens and the earth began to move in the events of history because that is what he does. And he did it in two different ways. In the hardest of times, he works in those things. In, in your time of suffering, in your time of pain, in your time of loss, he works, he works for your good, the eternal stuff of good. Not just good, this is how I like life to work. He works for your good and for his glory. And those are the things we're going to see as the story of God's revelation of himself continues to be rolled out. And this story makes it uh, beautifully clear. This is how God does things. What we learn, uh, what do we learn from this? Well, partly that even when, even when we think God doesn't care, he's actually watching closely and with great compassion for us. He hears us when we pray. He walks with us, before us, carries us, encourages us. And he has a solution for every problem you're ever going to face. And he also has a way out. And whether that's in this life, in eternity, in his big plan of things and how he does it, it'll always be that you can count on this for your good, even when you don't understand it, and for his glory. And that's the part that we're not, usually not quite so interested in. God had seen the plight of his people. He had compassion on them, hopelessly captive, until God started moving. And all of a sudden, where there was no hope, hope is established. Moses followed God's direction. He leads the Israelites out of Egypt, God's mighty hand of power evident. You get this cluster of miracles. As you read through the, through the Bible, there are times, periods of time, when there are clusters of miracles. You don't see miracles consistently running like this on a graph all the way through. You see, you see the creation, then you see this, the exodus, and then you're going to roll along. and You'll see touches of God that are of the miraculous along the way, here, there, God's presence, God's power on display. When you get to Elijah and Elisha, it spikes again really big, and then it's going to be pretty quiet until Jesus and the, and the apostles and the establishing of the early church. This is one of those times where there is a cluster of evidence of the power and the presence of God. And God told Moses why he does it that way. He said, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the Israelites from among them. Okay, so now I've, I'm reading through my new Bible that I started in July for my second run through in, in uh, reading through the Bible this year, and I'm highlighting away, and I just finished this last week uh, the book of Jeremiah over and over and over again in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, here, God says through the prophet, here's what I'm going to do. You know why? That the people of Edom will know that I am the Lord, that the people of Egypt will know that I am the Lord, that the people of Babylon will know that I am the Lord. That statement occurs over a hundred times in the scriptures. Why, why does God do what God does? That people will know that he is the Lord, that he is God, and there is no other. Well, through this series of miraculously delivered plagues, the world of the Egyptians is thrown into a tailspin. All those plagues relate to Egyptian gods, and God shows he's God and they're not. Stubborn Pharaoh finally says, okay, enough of that. You guys get out of here. And you, you're read, you be reading about that this week, uh, working through that in your groups next Sunday. Yeah, just get out of here. So the Bible says there are about 600,000 men among the Israelites. And you tack on, even conservatively, women and children. You're somewhere in the two and a half million range is the estimate most scholars come up with for the time. They started their journey back toward the land of promise, the, the land of freedom. Now, the most direct route would have taken them uh, on about a 200-mile journey to get back to the land of Canaan, the promised land. They would have gone through the Isthmus of Suez 
And it would have taken them right into the land of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, they have advanced uh, technology. Uh, they're, they've developed uh, their, their metal works in such a way that their weapons are better. They're a warlike people. And, and God knew this bunch of former slaves, recently uh, released slaves and shepherds, uh, they, they'd be overwhelmed by the threat of a military conflict with the Philistines. So... God takes a different route. Now, the people had their doubts about Moses still and his leadership, and we've seen that during the course of things uh, in the deliverance from Egypt. And They have more than a few questions about God because they're still trying to get to know him in this process. So God's leading them pretty miraculously, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And the people followed Moses, and they followed his God, and they followed him into this geographic cul-de-sac. Now, now they're, they're hemmed in with the Red Sea in front of them. Somewhere along in this time, Pharaoh, he gets word of this. And he realizes, I just gave up my whole workforce of slaves. And we, we learned from the story of the Exodus, the Egyptians were so glad for him to go. The Israelites said, hey, well, give us your stuff. And they took most of the treasure, treasure of Egypt with them. Well, Pharaoh's not too keen on that. And now he sees they have gone into this cul-de-sac. So, the Egyptian gods must have returned uh, with their favor upon Egypt. And we are picking up and we are going. The Egyptians were famous for their chariot warfare. How they did it, the, 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 the technology and the strategy of it. So they have 600 royal chariots, but then their frontier outposts, because you don't wait until the enemy army gets on top of you before you want to engage them. They have outposts out from the major cities. Those guys, the Bible says, they join in and you have a pretty significant chariot army charging toward these people of God. And panic set in among the people of God. Seems uh, in the scriptures and in life, God often seems to place his children in pos positions of profound difficulty. Last week we said, God wants you to go on a journey. The, the Christian life is not just a place where you sit and soak. The Christian life is a journey. You go from point A to point B, and you keep on moving from point A to point B. It's a journey because you take faith steps, and if you're just sitting and soaking, you're not faithing anything. You're not moving, and you're not letting God move in you. So it's a journey. Well, here, sometimes to get things moving... God will put you in a place of profound difficulty. And here he's led them into a wedge, no escape. And we start to question, is God big enough to get me out of this? I found myself in some of those places. Some of you at extreme levels have found yourself in places where you are hemmed in and you do not know where to go. And there seems to be no way out. And no matter how hard you think, or how much money you expend, or all, how much effort you, you it, you're not going to get better on your own. We ask, has God forgotten me? Does God care about me? And why did God let this happen? There's a story about a, a guy, uh, he, he was doing a transatlantic crossing back first of all, the last century, and uh, he spent almost the whole trip just hanging over the rail multiple shades of green miserable uh, every moment of the trip and at one point uh, steward came to the man hanging over the rail and said sir I, I just want you to know don't be discouraged don't be discouraged to my knowledge no one has ever died of seasickness and the story goes, with murderous eyes, he looked at the steward and said, it is the thought of dying. That is, that is the only thing that's kept me alive until now, is the hope of death. We feel we're in a deep hole and we have no hope. And we begin to believe God has led me into this disaster. He has created a mess for me. He's deserted me. And that's the way the people following after Moses felt. 
But here's, here's how God does things. Instead of it being a hole, because we think it's a hole, it's, it's a disaster, it's a pit. Instead of a hole, when God leads you to a place like this, in God, for your good, for His glory, it's actually a platform from which God can work toward your good, but also display His glory on, on a stage uh, that will draw other people to Him, that the people will know that I am the Lord. And I'll give you a lesson you'll never forget. I don't know if you've ever been, been between the devil and the deep Red Sea. But you may have asked the questions the children of Israel must have asked. Because they wondered, is God big enough? And that's where we're going to focus in this morning. I want to read a portion of this story. Pick it up from here. Verse 10 is where I'm going to start out. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified, cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians. Man, being a slave was awesome. This is terrible, this freedom thing. What a weird statement. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. The Lord said to Moses, that's a pretty big statement. Well, Moses, he's as freaked out as everybody else, I think. But the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. And as for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. As for me, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they'll go in after them. And I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army and his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, is God big enough? And we try to answer some of these questions from uh, these verses. Is God big enough to calm our fears? National survey here in our country not too long ago, people were asked, what is the basic feeling you have about life? Feeling. What is the basic feeling? How would you define what, how you feel about life? 60% of Americans said fear is their basic feeling about life. Fear. People are afraid of uh, political strife. They're afraid of economic problems. They're afraid of health problems, spiritual darkness in our world, around us, in us. We're afraid to go out at night because we're afraid of what might be lurking in the darkness. We're afraid to go out during the day because of what we can see and what we do know. The children of Israel were in a tight spot. There was no way out. They couldn't run. They were poorly equipped to fight. They had no options except maybe to be overwhelmed by fear. And so I ask you the question, so what are you afraid of today? We're a fear-filled country. Uh, the, the, the news just tries to generate that in us to make us more insecure. They throw out things to us time and time again. We, we have so much news coverage of so many bad things. We all... Uh, Start being overwhelmed by it. What are you afraid of? For some of you, it is job stuff and health stuff and family stuff, security in our world. And the question remains, is God big enough to calm our fears? I, I think about uh, Peter, the apostle Peter. And Jesus comes walking to this group of disciples. They're in a boat in a storm. And Jesus comes walking to meet them, walking on the water. Peter says... Uh, Lord, if that's you, I'm willing to step out if you'll invite me. And Jesus does. He steps out. And Peter's walking on the water until he starts looking around. He sees the wind, the waves. It gets a little overwhelmed. He starts to sink. He cries out, and Jesus reaches out to him, takes him into the boat, and the storm and the seas are all calm. Sometimes God rescues you from. Sometimes God rescues you in. Sometimes God rescues you uh, in ways that bring him glory that may be hard still for you, but, but eternal touch of 
blessing on your life. We're just going to say when it comes to calming your fears, God's big enough. Is God big enough to deal with our doubts? Oh, man. Doubts were a struggle. The Egyptians were coming up in a hurry. Panic spread. The Israelites' first reaction, cry out to God. That's a good move. But quickly, they turned on Moses in anger and more than a little bit of sarcasm. Oh, wouldn't it be better if we were still in Egypt? By the way, that's their favorite song because they're going to sing it over and over again. Through the rest of this journey with Moses, every time things get a little bit hard and a little bit bad, oh, for the good old days. We lived as slaves. We had no freedom. We made no choices of our own. Oh, my. Wasn't it wonderful back then? Humiliation every day, despair, hopelessness. They came to doubt the whole mission. They doubted Moses and his leadership. They doubted God's care. And I think we'd probably make good friends with this group of people because we have so much in common. Uh, we, we live in the present, the crisis of the moment, and God can bless and encourage and guide for decades, and then something happens that's not according to our plan and not the way we'd want life to go, and we run into the wall of something, some challenge, and well, God doesn't care. There's no use at why, why have I been going to church all these years? I might as well give up. God's not going to take care of me. And we abandon in the moment of crisis because we're people who live so much in the present. Is God big enough when we're doubting his goodness and fairness and love and concern and care? And I'm going to say he is. He's big enough to deal with our doubts because we're... I know me, I am short, 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 wow, that was hard to say that. I thought it would be when I saw it on paper. Short-sighted and shallow and unable to speak well like Moses. But see, this God has already revealed himself to Moses as the great I am. He is the Yahweh, Yahweh, the great I am. And it means he's, he's the one who was and he's the one who will be but he's also the one, one God in control, glorious, wonderful, grace-filled and caring, holy right now. He's big enough. Third thing, is God big enough to handle our crises? And sometimes it feels like we're outgunned and so is God when it comes to such times. I had this story I found years ago in good old Reader's Digest. It was uh, about a family-owned business. It was a startup that depended on a lot of walk-up traffic and in a fairly large building in a suburban business park. And, well, somebody called in a bomb threat to the building. And they had to, they had to get out of the building. But the mom that was in this family-owned business, she, she knew... I don't ever want to miss a customer. So she put a sign on the door. And uh, it was uh, quick and effective. And she just wrote, bomb scare, back in half an hour. Please wait. <laughs> and I love that story. And I'll tell you why in a second. But some of our doubts and fears about God relate to the crises of life. You know, it's the, wow, he had, had a car wreck. You went to the doctor and got this terrible diagnosis. It's the accident, the sudden scares of life. And our problem is that in those sudden things, we see them as eternal. That that's, this, is gonna, this, this is the eternal, the, the crisis moment. And unlike the lady in the story, we can't see beyond the crisis. We can't see that there's, there's a bigger God and a bigger eternity out there. The people pinned against the Red Sea by the Egyptian army had a crisis and it was not their crisis the day before. It would not be their crisis the day after. It was the crisis on this day. And is God big enough to handle right now? And Moses had a confidence in crisis. You know, I, the, the things that are a crisis for a, for a child don't seem very big to adults. But they're big to the children. And the things that are a big crisis to me don't seem very big to God. And like when my children were young and in crisis, I just gathered them up and encouraged them forward and loved them. And not to try to explain 
what they couldn't understand, but just to love them. God does the same thing for me as an adult. and He'll do the same thing for you as an adult. He picks us up and loves us and cares for us. And here's the thing. If it wasn't for those times when I just need to run and jump in, into his arms, uh, climb up into God's lap, and just say, I got nothing. I'm desperate and I need you. If it wasn't for those times, I would have missed out on so many great experiences with God. Because my greatest experiences with God, my closest touches from God have come in the worst of things. Because I had nowhere to turn but to Him. And I found out He's big enough. Is God big enough to fight our battles? The great theologian Charlie Brown of Peanuts said, There is no problem so big that I cannot run away from it. Sometimes we struggle and struggle with problems, don't we? And it's marriage and parenting and friendships and finances and health. And we try and try to fix it. And we think we're gifted and we think we have the resources. And we fight our battles alone. And it might be good sometimes just to take Charlie Brown's advice and say, I'm not going to try to do all this myself. And I'm not going to wait until I'm at the end of me completely before I ask God for help. Because I know where this road goes. I need him. Could the Israelites have made their last stand on the shores of the Red Sea? Yes, they would have been massacred. Instead, instead of a slaughter, we hear Moses say one of the great statements in the Bible. I remember, and I've talked to you about reading through the Bible, and I've, I've been at this for a while. The first time I read all the way through the Bible was in, in Mark and stuff. I was in middle school, in uh, seventh grade, and... This is a verse I marked in Exodus. If you don't have anything marked in Exodus, you might want to mark that verse 14. There, the Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. Let God do what God can do. If, if you're, how much energy do you expend trying to, trying to do it yourself? Complaining to God, griping about life, despairing of circumstance. And if we put that same effort into trusting God, growing our faith in God, spending time in the Word of God, uh, oh, how much more could be accomplished? God is big enough to fight our battles, and you just ought to let Him have it. Fifth thing. Is God big enough to perform miracles? Ooh, that's a good question. Verse 15, God gave the command. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. I've always enjoyed that, that God tells Moses that. And I have to think that, just tell them to go forward. And Moses said, well, uh, I, I appreciate the thought, God, but you know, there is this little problem. Oh, this large body of water that's blocking our path. Verse 16 gives the details. As for you. Moses, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. It's going to take a little faith to even do, do the hand motions of that gesture for Moses, but he does. Now again, to God's command, I think there had to be a little bit of, just had Lee's a staff. Uh, okay, here we go. Oh, I got it. I may have misunderstood part of what you said. The people are whining pretty heavy, and the water's lapping against the shoreline. And I just, I just for clarity's sake, could you repeat that last thing? God called him to take a step of faith, and then he would do what he does, and he would do it gloriously. And the Bible says the sea swept back, a wall of water on each side of them, and they walked through, not through a muddy mire, but... They walk through on dry land from one side to the other. Now, if you read a commentary on the book of Exodus, you're going to find this more often than not in most any commentary. In fact, I had a couple of professors who threw this my way in my educational journey who said, well, the thing is, Moses had been spending time in this wilderness for uh, 40 years before he went back to Egypt and he was aware of the low water crossings. There are places he could have crossed in the upper part of the sea there that the water's only about a foot deep. And I've seen uh, 
movie reenactments of this scene where they're sloshing along in about waist deep water trying to get away and uh, I remember when the came across the thought for the first time well that's not what the Bible says at all but even if that was true it's still a miracle because Pharaoh's whole army drowned in a foot of water that's pretty amazing right yeah here's what I want to tell you God is the creator he established the guiding laws of nature and set this world in motion Colossians says and he holds it all together But because he's God, and this is going to be an important factor for all of us to remember as we continue to journey through the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that God does intervene in history. And because he's God, he can do the miraculous. He can do things above and beyond what are according to the laws of science. Because he created the laws. He does miraculous things. And I want you to know this. He can do miraculous things in you. God is big enough. So here we are, all of us gathered up in uh, whatever situation you're in. God knows your situation, and he knows the way out, and he can intervene, and he can provide. Because here's the thing about the nature of God. It is not his desire for anybody to be enslaved in any kind of captivity. And some of it, you're enslaved to something. Uh, we talk about hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And you're slave to it. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It may be a good thing by our culture's reckoning, but it's keeping you from God. And that makes it a bad thing. And we have been freed through the blood of Jesus Christ from the greatest captivity of all. And that is the, the curse, the penalty, the power of sin. And God's leading us to the fullness of his promises. As you look at the theology of the Bible, the greatest redemptive event in the Old Testament is this story. The story of God parting the waters and the people walking through on dry land. The water comes back in destroys Pharaoh's mighty army. God is glorified. When uh, I'm reading Joshua now, and when Joshua leads the children of Israel into the promised land, uh, one of the things that Rahab says, who hides the spies that Joshua sends over to Jericho, she says, we're all still talking about what happened 40 years earlier when God parted the Red Sea. The the psalmists go back to it multiple, multiple times. It is the greatest redemptive event in the Old Testament when God delivered his people from the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. But the greatest redemptive event of all is Jesus delivering us from sin at the cross. And this is one of those times when we, we have an Old Testament story that all those New Testament guys, they point back to this story and say, because that's how God does stuff. He's a God who wants to set us free. He's a God who wants to break the chains that bind us. He's a God who redeems and restores and renews and delivers. And he is big enough. And that's the gospel story. Jesus who died on the cross and was raised from the dead for us. Today, we got all our problems, we got all our fears, we have all our struggles. But my greatest burden for anybody's life, because nothing starts moving till this starts moving, is that you may have gone to church for a long time. You may have, uh, you may have a whole stack of Bibles at your house. You've heard the story of the gospel, but you're still trapped in your sin. And I say that because there was a time in my life when that was my story. I was trapped in my sin. And I couldn't escape it by trying to be a better person or trying to do religious stuff. I was lost. And I was separated from God in time and for eternity. And I would spend eternity in hell if I died. And that, that became my overriding fear. But I came to know the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Who died on the cross to pay for my sin. And was raised from the dead to prove the work of the cross and his identity as God. 
and I surrendered my life to him, putting all my faith in him. And now I am free and victorious and hope-filled and guided by my Lord Jesus Christ. Now what I want to ask you is, do you have a story like that? Not, well, yeah, you know, I, I've been baptized. That's, that's the answer I usually get. I've been baptized. You know, my parents raised me going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Well, you know, I'm trying, like a guy I talked to about a month ago uh, in his 70s. Yeah, well, I'm trying hard. I'm working on it. What I'm grateful for is in that conversation, that 70-something-year-old guy gave his life to Jesus. And, and you can too. Today, right now, this is, when, this is when the Red Sea of sin and brokenness parts for you. I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus right now. If you have never made that commitment, you've never taken that step, I want to lead you in a commitment kind of prayer. Just These, these are just words. They've got to be your words. has to be your heart, God's heart. And I haven't done it this way in a while. Some of you have never prayed this kind of prayer before. You've never prayed. We pray about everything. This prayer is not one you just keep on praying, keep on praying, keep on praying. It's, it's, it's like getting married. This is one that puts the ring on the finger. You in relationship to God. But I want all of us to say this out loud. Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. So let's bow our heads. Some of you have never prayed this before. Some of you, it's just going to be just going to be remembering and celebrating what Jesus has already done in your life. But let's say it out loud together. Say, Dear God, thank you that you love me. I know I've sinned. Please forgive me. Today, I turn away from sin. Today, I give my life to Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he was raised from the dead. Today, I surrender my life to Jesus. Come into my life, Jesus. Wash away my sins. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. Erase my name from the book of death. Write my name in your book of life in heaven. Thank you for this glorious gift. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.